So the end user should not be aware when he's executing either basic or Python script. He should have the same user interface also for errors or um, several boxes, whatever. You know, you know knowledge is not necessary. However, some properties uh, return anyway a you know object and as such facilitate the access to you know instances. The API is inspired by uh, Microsoft extensions to VBA, also by uh, a huge number of Python built-in functions, also other uh, PHP and other IDs that we had. Uh, also by a pre-existing library known as the basic primitives that was designed by Jean-François Nifnecker. On this slide, uh, an, an important word is the word automation. So we speak about repeatable things. It's important to know when we design methods and uh, it's important to know that we focus on automation of repeatable things. So in the beginning, we uh, had the question, should we implement the API in basic or in Python? Uh, there were a number of prerequisites uh, to decide what we should do. We wanted uh, object-oriented API, basic is obviously weak in that matter. Uh, we cannot have inheritance in basic, in basic and we have a constraint that uh, a basic object should be created inside the library. Afterwards, it can, however, be used anywhere. We wanted uh, to be able to use a GUI well, uh, we know that Python, as shipped with Allo, of course, does not, uh, has, does not have such uh, GUI, and uh, we had a lack there for, for in, uh, in favor of BASIC. Dynamic call is important because we wanted to be able to um, execute a function from one environment to functions available in the other, and vice versa. So, dynamic call is done, we will see, with the script provider mechanism. Uh, in basic, we have for dynamic calls to methods inside an object instance, we have there a call by name function, not well known, but uh, it, it is available in basic and very important, like we have in Python has attribute and get attribute that we can use uh, to uh, uncallable objects uh, in, uh, in Python. We need persistent, persistent memory. Why is that? Well, scripts are not only executed in batch. Uh, they are also uh, they are, are often executed in start-stop mode. It uh, just think to uh, events. So scripts are executed intermittently. Also to store, let's say, error messages in the user's language or to store a log of debug info, or to keep a list of services that are available somewhere, we needed persistent memory. BASIC as a good solution for that, with global variables that last uh, as long as the LO session lasts. And uh, we had a lag there to use easily that kind of things in Python. And we needed namespaces because when we make an API with a huge number of functions, we must be able to segment the names and uh, BASIC is very bad in that matter. So, in the first step, we were very embarrassed. We could not make the choice and we had here a number of reflections about namespaces in BASIC. Well, to, uh, to be able to define completely a function, we need to qualify it with global scope. For instance, uh, the library name, module, function. This is the full qualifi qualification that is minimal to prevent completely collisions. But 
this is also not known probably, well, it's quite easy to define a module as basic object. And you can assign a module to a variable and you can reassign it. And from that variable, you can call a function. Like you see here. So we revised our first judgment and we decided to make the API mainly in basic. Okay, ScriptForge is said service oriented. What does it mean exactly? Well, everything starts from the already described create script service function in basic or Python, same syntax. An object is returned. On that object, apply methods and properties. So writing user scripts is very easy. You have here comparison of uh, copy file, delete folder uh, methods on the same file system uh, service that is proposed in the API. Create script service returns either a real basic or Python object referring to a module or it returns a basic class instance. In that case, arguments can be passed in the create script service uh, method itself. So what happens behind the scenes? I don't want here to, to to give details, you can read it on your own if you want later. The idea is uh, that um, we defined, in fact, a framework making the addition of a new service very straightforward. And that's important to understand. So adding a new library, new service is really easy. Okay, now uh, the syntax uh, must be identical, but there are also other things to consider when we compare the implementation basic and Python. So first of all, we need an identical programming interface so that the user is not aware of executing a basic or a Python script. To call a method from one world to the other one, we use the script provider a mechanism and we must be able to do that in both directions. There were a number of uh, limitations in that mechanism. Not all data types are processed equally. A critical are dates because uh, any language or any uh, database or calc and so on, and so on Every uh, application has its own internal represent representation of dates, and that's, a, that's a, um, an issue. Also, native objects cannot be transferred from one world to the other. Uh, you cannot transfer a basic object to Python, and you cannot transfer a Python object to basic. So we had to define, to define a protocol. The protocol is not very complex, but it as to handle a number of things like data types. Example, <clears throat> all dates are transferred both for the arguments or for the return value as, as uh, you know date time data types. Are the interfaces seen from the user scripts really identical or are they similar? Uh, example, uh, basic is fully case insensitive, is that managed? Well, just the question that we had. Well, if you look at uh, the code that is here, quite easy. Well, in Python, you just have to import the create script service function from a module that is shipped with hello called scriptforge.py. We uh, create uh, an instance of the database service 
and we store that in variable A. That opens the database uh, that you probably know as bibliography. And we want to have uh, the execution of a, of a select statement to store as an array or as a tuple of tuples, in fact, in B, the rows contained as a result of that SQL statement. What do you have in scriptforge.py? Well, py, sorry. Well, quite easy. Uh, create script service is here a function uh, at the bottom of the module. You have the SF database class and a few, really a few definitions of the service. The implementation is done in the basic world. The properties are listed in a dictionary and the item part is just a Boolean value indicating whether the, the property is editable or not. Where is is a property and it is not editable. And you have then the method get rows with its arguments and its default values. And get shows executes just a standard exec method with a number of parameters. And uh, we will see what this gives. In fact, the SF database class is a subclass of SF services. And there is the magic. In fact, you have there a, a, a number of uh, quite tricky uh, internal uh, methods, the, the double underscore methods, init, get attribute, and set attribute are not that easy. But for instance, the uh, care for having uh, uh, a certain freedom about property names, method names, and uh, arguments. So you can use lowercase, proper case, or camel case, whatever you want or what you prefer. Common error handling, you saw probably that the SQL statement given as argument of get shows is wrong. Well, in both cases, you call that from basic, you call that from Python, you get the same error message. You see, by the way, how user-friendly the error messages are. And um, we have we had already in basic a limitation. It was impossible for Scriptforge to report the line number of the code line that raised the error. Uh, that's why we define in the protocol when uh, basic reports an error. Well, Python processes that error and uh, the exception end of Python displays the full stack of lines of code which play the role in the error and one of them it's uh, here line 27 in uh, module testsf.py uh, can be listed so with Python we have more information when uh, the scripts uh, go wrong. The counterpart of the, in the protocol uh, at the basic side is implemented in a Python dispatcher function. And that function, uh, well, is quite simple. It processes the input arguments, for instance, dates, call the correct property or method and return what must be, what must be returned, also after enrichment. I mean uh, here that, uh, for instance, uh, the return values are, of course, the value itself, but uh, eventually also the var type of uh, uh, the, the return value and also other things. This makes a reinterpretation of the return values at the Python, at the Python side possible if necessary. So we use internally basic objects and in fact at the Python side the object reference sorry 
is the entry of the basic object in an object's cache that is stored in a persistent memory. For debugging, we use in both environments a function called debug print. It's similar to debug.print in VBA, but we could not make a debug service because print is a reserved word, both in Python and in basic. So we use here debug print uh, that we can call from both environments. It's uh, a part of the exception service. What does debug print? Well, it uh, stores uh, and logs records in the persistence, persistent memory. And those uh, records, uh, that those logged records can be displayed in a model or a non-model so-called console. Well, what is specific here, Python and basic share the same console. This is an example, if we have uh, a piece of code written in Python and another one written in basic, they are identical, but one script is triggered when mouse hovers one dialog console and the other uh, script is uh, triggered when the mouse hovers the, another console, both right in the console, well, you reach this, you can have a mix of messages or debug traces where the origin is in basic or in Python, you can mix them uh, smoothly in the same script for console. An alternative to this is to, is to use a Python shell console. It requires that the AppSo extension is installed. This is, uh, AppSo is for alternative script organizer for Python. You can run immediate statements, including statements that uh, call uh, uh, ScriptForge API uh, methods. And you can call from basic. In, in, you have then all the, the print statements that you have in your Python code uh, will be issued in the Python shell console, and you can have from basic a specific Python print method that will write in the same console here. Jean-Pierre, just yes. a quick notice, five minutes left. Okay, well, um, uh, a bit, a bit uh, faster then. Okay, we have also helpers that we defined for uh, both environments. Here, a number of functions, an example here is string, you can hash a string, but it's done thanks to the import of hashlib in a specific script for helper.py uh, module. And you can have also a number of basic functions that are made available to Python. The, the example of message box was already seen with uh, Raphael uh, before, but the number of uh, basic functions that are implemented to be called also from Python is uh, larger than that. Uh, because the those functions are most of, for most of them well known and quite easy to use. Everything is uh, in the documentation. Uh, there is also a special page about how to script in Python for script forge. Um, what will be new in the future? I wanted to stress that also. Well, here uh, we will have a new chart service with uh, a scenario here. Uh, the scenario is that we extract data from a database. We copy what we extracted from the database in a calc uh, document. The calc document is hidden, and so it's uh, hap everything happens in the background. We design and customize a chart 
we exported sorry we exported to a file and the file can be displayed with a few lines you see uh, in uh, 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 image console of a dialog what we also plan for the future uh, the first four items are already in master um, also outputs output documents of export documents to pdf and to printers with a number of options we will have automatic translation of everything what is fixed content in a dialogue uh, into the native language of the user we will have table consoles in dialogues the other ids that we have are already specified and there exist uh, prototypes of them but they are not yet developed as such and on not yet in the in the in master or in any repository we think to have a sf widgets library with especially a pop-up menu service a functionality that is often requested in forums uh, we would like to have a number service about roundings unit conversions uh, uh, it's uh, sp uh, especially uh, designed for uh, managing double uh, variables and also a region service to know, for instance, what time it is in Tokyo when it is 12 o'clock in Brussels or on the green Greenwich Meridian and to have a UTC no function, for instance. Okay, um, the end was a bit faster, but I think I'm still <laughs> in time. <laughs> If I you are. Clock you are okay, okay, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you okay, very okay. much for this clear and great talk. Uh, very great to see this work on ScriptForge. I think, uh, as I'm a Python programmer by myself, it's uh, really, really um, nice to see that this is shipped with uh, 7.1 and 7.2, and as you mentioned, for the for the further versions. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, Thank you. I will have a look at the questions if there are questions. I don't um, know and answer yeah. them directly if, if on the Telegram. If there are questions, right? please mention it in the uh, chat room. Um, I've seen uh, so far no one, but uh, perhaps you have a okay. look uh, a few minutes uh, longer in this chat room. So thank you. Please could you okay, you're welcome. share please uh, your slides? Yes. So let's have a look. Hussein is in the room but he have pre-recorded um, his video, so I will have to start it in uh, 20 minutes, uh, 20 seconds, not minutes. So, Hossein will uh, talk about LibreOffice Software Development Kit and I think his work about overhauling example, I think it's renewing, actualizing uh, things which are um, written and uh, in documentation um, in the uh, SDK. Um, and uh, let's start the video. It's uh, not uh, um, exactly 30 minutes, but 28. So if there are questions in the meantime, please post it in the um, in the chat room so that we can uh, have uh, Hossein with answers there. And here we go. Hello. Today I will talk about LibreOffice SDK examples overhaul. I'm Hossein Nurikha, the developer community architect for the Document Foundation TDF. So these are the contents that I will present today. After a short self-introduction, I will talk about LibreOffice SDK, its use cases, and the programming languages that can be used with it. Then we will talk about LibreOffice SDK examples. Most of these examples should be compiled and executed using shell scripts right now. And you have to use CYGWIN on Windows. But it is also possible to use modern build tools like QMake and CMake. And that's what I'm talking about today. After talking a little bit, I will show you a demo and after demo we will talk about some of the future work like porting examples from different languages 
to each other and also adding QMIC and CMIC support to these examples. I'm Hossein Nuriha, PhD in Information Technology. I am the Developer Community Architect for the Document Foundation. I'm a developer, university lecturer, and FOSS advocate. So if you want to get started in LibreOffice development, you can contact me and I will try to help you. My email is hossein at sign libreoffice.org and you can also find me in IRC room LibreOffice Dev in Libra Chat Network by the name of Hossein. So these are some of the use cases of LibreOffice SDK, which is essentially a part of LibreOffice that helps you to communicate with LibreOffice via its API. You can create applications that work with Office formats, different Office programs from different companies across the world. As you know, LibreOffice supports many Office formats from different companies from different countries. Also, you can write extensions that extend the functionalities of LibreOffice. And at last, just like the first use case, you can create converters that read and write different formats and convert them together. There are several programming languages that can be used with LibreOffice SDK. Python is a great choice because it's easy to set up. A Python interpreter is usually shipped with LibreOffice and you can write simple programs very fast and run and test them easily. Also, you can use C++ and using C++ is important because it helps you to better understand the language that is used to write LibreOffice itself. Also, Java is used. Many examples are in Java. LibreOffice Basic is something that is used inside LibreOffice and is also used for communicating with LibreOffice API. .NET languages like C Sharp and VB.NET are also usable, but you should note that the latest .NET Core is not usable right now. OLE and ActiveX are also usable. So what about examples? Examples showcase the LibreOffice SDK capabilities. They are there to show you the capabilities that SDK can provide. They are in many languages, most of them are in Java, but there are examples in Python, C++, etc. And they work with LibreOffice through its API. So a working LibreOffice process should be present in order to be able to respond to the requests. And you should note that not all the LibreOffice examples, Azteca examples, are extensions. Some of them are standalone applications that communicate with LibreOffice. So where to find them? These examples are distributed both with the LibreOffice source code and also the binary distribution. So if you go to LibreOffice.org, you can download both LibreOffice and the Azteca. And if you use the source code, you can find ODK slash examples via, via core repository. And also there is a dedicated SDK examples repository in git.libreoffice.org that contains some examples. If you have installed LibreOffice and LibreOffice SDK, you can find SDK slash examples folder that contains all of these examples. So what do they do? They actually do various things. They focus on C++ examples today. So I will talk about some of these examples. 
document loader and draw are the LibreOffice examples. You can find them inside ODK slash examples slash CPP inside the source code. And also they are shipped with LibreOffice binary Azteca. And document loader essentially loads the sample document. The draw creates some circles and other drawings inside LibreOffice draw. And the last one, Converter, is something that I've written and you can find it in my GitHub page that you can see the address. It essentially convert ODT or other file format to PDF. So how to compile and run these examples? These are the instructions that are recommended today. But after that, I will talk about using modern build tools. So first of all, you should run LibreOffice. If you're using the latest version, you should invoke LibreOffice 7.2. But after that, you should provide some options in order to make LibreOffice listen to the incoming connections. As you can see, it's dash dash accept equal socket comma port equals 2083 semicolon urp semicolon after that you should go to stk folder cd slash opt slash libreoffice 7.2 slash stk then you invoke the um, uh, a script that sets up the environment variable set stk env underline unix then you go to examples folder and invoke make as you can see, I'm uh, trying to compile and execute document loader. And after that, by invoking make document loader dot run, I can actually run the example. So this is the result of set sticker in the underlying Unix a script that is usable in Linux and Unix. So as you can see, uh, the STK folder, the office folder, and the path to several utilities and also C++ compiler and Java are set here and also the output directory is inside your home directory I don't use Java here so it is um, not used here on Windows the instructions are somehow the same first of all you should uh, invoke sofficeexe with the same parameters then uh, you can use uh, the uh, VS2019 command prompt or you set the compiler path manually. I go to uh, program files, the Brofis Azteca in uh, a terminal, and after that, I add the CYGWIN uh, binary path, and after that, I invoke set Azteca in the underlying windows.path that sets the environment variables on Windows. Uh, you should be aware that in some situations uh, when you try to run the examples it uh, complains about the lack of merged lo.dll so if that happens you should set the ure underlying bootstrap variable manually uh, it is uh, essentially uh, the path to the fundamental ini uh, file on Windows and in Linux, uh, it's the path to fundamental uh, RC file. After that, you go to the folder and invoke make, and just like Linux, after that, you invoke make document loader dot run. So this is the result of uh, setting up environment on Windows. As you can see, uh, the utilities are provided by CYGWIN and the C++ compiler path uh, points to uh, Microsoft Visual uh, Studio 2019 compiler. So the requirements are essentially LibreOffice plus Azteca and also C++ compiler, but there are a lot of other dependencies like make, zip, cat, set, etc. These are provided by CYGWIN for Windows and uh, a lot of things are done via shell scripts. Both the compilation and execution are uh, done by the um, uh, shell script to set up environment variables. But what about modern build tools? 
What if requirements would be only LibreOffice plus Steka plus C++ compiler and a modern build tool like CMake or QMake? In fact, this is possible. The main benefit of using CMake is that you can use ID of your choice for development uh, like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, Qt Creator, Xcode and many others support CMake natively so with CMake you don't have to rely on shell scripts but you can use uh, these build tools inside your ID of your choice but you should know that generating headers, setting up environment variables, and running the applications are mostly done by CMake and QMake with some tricks. These are some of the environment variables that are used inside LibreOffice. Salius VCL plugin is something that uh, sets the UI that is used with LibreOffice. Where by using gen or gtk or uh, things like that you can set the desired UI. Unopath is something that is used uh, with some of the examples and I've discussed URE underlying bootstrap and as you can see it points to the fundamental RC in Linux. So let's see these uh, things in action in a demo. Let's see some of these examples. I've essentially copied some of these examples to this folder so that I can compile and run them inside this folder. Let's go to document loader example and I'm creating a build folder. I'm going inside it. I invoke CMake for the top full uh, for the uh, upper folder and I invoke make everything goes just fine but in order to be able to run this example first I should set you are able to strap so you are able to strap I'm exporting the URX uh, bootstrap equals to essentially the path name I've talked about. So this is okay, but I have to um, have a process, uh, a LibreOffice process in order to uh, work with it. So I'm executing LibreOffice with the parameters I've discussed and these are the examples I was working on before so after that uh, I can see the binary here I uh, invoke it with uh, one parameter that is the file I want to load this is tested ODT and as you can see the separate process document loader could be able to load a file inside LibreOffice. That's it. It worked just fine. But what if I don't want to um, use this environment variable? I don't want to build uh, from command line. I can, uh, as you see, export dash n you are able to strap and as I'm searching for URE and bootstrap I see that uh, I no longer see that it is set because I've used export dash n to unexport it um, but I have to edit the file and add some things to this file so I go to the main as you can see uh, we're using some special main here and this is the line I have to add and then you, as you can see RTL bootstrap set is something that can be used to set this variable that is used inside 
this STECO application. Uh, also, I have to include RTL slash bootstrap .hxx. That's it. I invoke make, and as you can see, the document loader example was built just fine. Uh, if I uh, start LibreOffice again, I can invoke this application. I should provide uh, the file I want to load, and as you can see, it worked just fine. So it is possible to use uh, CMake with these examples. Also, QMake can be used, and I will show you this later. Uh, you can use uh, QMake and CMake inside your favorite IDE and without relying on these uh, scripts you can build and run the applications. Let's see another example. So I go to the top folder of examples, I go to draw and I create a build folder, I go inside it, I invoke CMake and it configures just fine and it builds just fine. So in order to run this example, I have to set another environment variable. It is the UNOPath. And as you can see, it's the path to the uh, LibreOffice binaries. After that, I just invoke draw. So the fun fact here was that uh, I didn't have a LibreOffice process waiting uh, for the command. So uh, this example used uses another bootstrapping method that doesn't need a working LibreOffice process but uh, if there is no such process it actually invokes it and creates such process using the binaries so that's it um, please note that uh, setting UNOPath is somehow different with uh, the previous uh, variable. Um, you can also use commands that set this environment variable inside uh, the C++ example, but I'm not uh, talking more about it. Uh, let's take a look inside the uh, CMake file that we have here. So it essentially contains a standard uh, CMake commands. Uh, here we have a LO root variable here that we use for um, setting different environment variables. We're essentially uh, setting include directories and there are different uh, include directories. Some of them are inside the root but some of them are uh, created uh, from the headers that uh, we have inside our build folder. So if we go to the end of file, we will see that uh, we are using CPU MediCare to generate these headers from of API.rdb. So uh, there are a lot of header files now inside the build folder. Also, we are linking our application to uh, some of the libraries that uh, are available inside LibreOffice folder. So that's it, and um, it may look it may it may look somehow complicated, but uh, it is essentially the same for different examples. Instructions for compiling and running these examples inside. Windows is not much different from Windows. First of all, I should 
uh, Grand LibreOffice with the same parameters that I had in Linux and after that I can uh, do the next steps I go to uh, I, I uh, invoke set stk env underline windows dot bat the parameters that you see here are set by me before as you can see uh, the utilities are provided by CYGV and the C++ compiler is Microsoft 2019 uh, compiler after that I go to examples folder CPP and then document loader and I invoke make and as you can see I have built this example before so I want to uh, run the example but uh, if uh, the uh, URE uh, environment variable URE bootstrap is not set you will see that uh, it will complain about the lack of merged LO that DLL so I set it and after that as you can see uh, I can invoke make document loader dot run so it essentially loads the file and because it is inside program files it is read only that's it but as I've told you before it is possible to use uh, IDEs like Qt Creator so let's use it I will open an example LO converter that I've talked about before. Um, it gets uh, an ODT file and converts it to PDF. It contains both the CMake file and also the that pro file that is used in QMake. So let's uh, run it it uh, compiles and run so it says uh, the LibreOffice is not there so let's start LibreOffice first and then if you run it you can see that it says output tested PDF generated so what is this fine let's go to the source code if you look at the source code you see that uh, it takes test.odt as the document URL and test.pdf as the PDF URL that is the output. Everything is set inside the program, the connection string, the uh, URE bootstrap, you don't have to set it inside command line, and the other functions and methods that are used to create the PDF. So let's see the uh, input and output. I just close the LibreOffice and I open uh, the test.odt. This is the same ODT file, and this is the output. So, as you could see, we can use uh, modern build tools like CMake and QMake uh, for compiling and running these examples and this uh, has a lot of benefits uh, we don't rely on uh, command line to compile and uh, run the applications you can do everything inside your IDE and uh, you don't need CYGV on Windows so I think this can be very helpful for those who want to develop using uh, C++ and LibreOffice SDK. I hope you have enjoyed the demo so these are the future works the road ahead is described here 
this demo was only a proof of concept so the same thing can be done for other examples and there are a lot of things remaining to do first of all we can port other examples to different languages so the draw example is in Java and in C++ the document loader is in Java, C++ and Python but not all of the examples are in every language this is defined as an easy hack so it means that you can help and also it is possible to add QMake and CMake support for other examples at last we we'll talk about some of the recommended readings for LibreOffice SDK. The first one, Java LibreOffice Programming Book or JLOP, is a book written by Dr. Andrew Davison, and it is a great book that discusses various aspects of LibreOffice SDK and it uses Java. Also, you should note that a lot of good documentation can be found inside api.libreoffice.org so every SDK developer should refer to this address. Also, inside this address api.libreoffice.org slash doc slash tools you will find a lot of good descriptions about the tools that can be used for LibreOffice SDK development. And the last one, LibreOffice extension website is a place that you can find great extensions and their source code. And this is something that can help you to create extensions, extensions by, by learning them. stuff from other extension developers and others that have used LibreOffice API. Thank you very much. That's it. So, thank you, Hossein. So, we had one question from Raphael. I just want to mention it uh, for the streaming. He asked, thanks for your presentation. Is it possible to develop LibreOffice extension using this approach? If so, how do they integrate into LibreOffice? Hossein, perhaps you can repeat your answer from the chat uh, here. Uh, yeah, I, I just said uh, I didn't create extensions in this way. I mean, using CMake myself, but uh, it should be possible because it's about how you make the binaries and then uh, it is possible to uh, package them and use, it, uh, use them in LibreOffice. But uh, in fact, uh, not many of the uh, LibreOffice extensions are made using C++. Uh, this approach, uh, I think, uh, can be most uh, mostly used by those who want to learn more about uh, LibreOffice and I think this would be uh, very helpful for them. Okay, thank you so much Hossein, doing a great job as a development coach um, and you have mentioned you, all your contact um, possibilities if there are other questions or requests for help um, they can reach you via this ways. So we have to head over to the next um, talk. It is from Kaolan McNamara, and he is already in the room. It's uh, also a pre-recorded um, talk. Kaolan is uh, from Red Hat, a long-time and valued ecosystem partner from LibreOffice. He uh, talks about GTK4 port, um, this uh, widget toolkit, uh, version 4, about the version 4, which was released, I think, end of 2020. So, Kaolan, if you want to add something before the video, there's a possibility because your video is just 20 minutes. No, uh, 20 minutes is perfectly fine. I think you can go ahead and play it. Okay, so I start. It. 
In this presentation I'd like to give an update of the current status of the LibreOffice GTK4 port. And the first thing I'd like to do is go. So here we have our demo of the GTK4 version. Uh, we can clearly see something on screen and it looks like LibreOffice should. Uh, if we look at the menus, we see we have functioning menus. Here we can see that the menu is too tall to fit in the available space. We now have scrollable menus with a scroll bar in the side. Uh, the classic first dialogue to look at is the word count dialogue. Uh, here we can see that the buttons have now migrated to the top of the window instead of the classic at the bottom. Uh, all of the help buttons are now replaced by this little indicator instead. The other classic dialogue is insert manual break. Here again the same top uh, level buttons and here's an example of a combo box with a drop down menu working and if we enable that we have a functioning spin button there like that. Uh, look at more ones. If we insert table, select a more complicated dialogue. Here we have our tree view down here functioning perfectly fine and previews updated as we select each entry. And check buttons. And then if we look at format character and we have the usual notebook, multiple tabs, color selectors, all functioning under GTK4. Over here or drop down menus, custom widgets can be interacted with, and drop downs also working. The famous double decker notebooks also functioning as well, can't fit them into the ordinary space available. The two level mode is also working fine. And if we look over in Impress and select that and check down here, we can see that we have functioning OpenGL slide transitions in preview mode at least. We don't have them working yet in full screen, but there is enough functioning to show that it will work in the end. Typing works, of course. Context menus work. Context menus now slide like this. So, what has changed in GTK 4 from GTK 3? Uh, the first obvious thing is how events are managed has changed. Uh, in GTK 3 to get mouse and keyboard events and so on, you can connect directly to the GTK widget and connect to the signals such as the key press event, key release event and so on. Now to do that you have to create an event controller for the type of event you're looking for, in this case uh, key events. You add that controller to the widget and then connect to the uh, key press, key release events at the controller level. Uh, this has knock-on effects to other parts of the API as well so things like input methods and whatnot are all correspondingly changed to be uh, to work with controllers instead. This makes a lot of things actually more simple from our perspective. Uh, that GTK event itself is now opaque and you can't uh, pull out with individual members. Either some accessors have been added or in many of the cases the required data that we need appears as arguments to the controller callbacks. All of this is relatively straightforward from a LibreOffice perspective. Cut and paste. Well, the first simple thing is that GTK Clipboard has basically been renamed to GDK Clipboard. Uh, the way we want to operate with the Clipboard is that we just want to get the formats that are available in the Clipboard. Uh, there are MIME types. And then we just want to get the raw data of that and afterwards we do the conversion ourselves into our own internal formats or vice versa from our own external formats. We put them into the Clipboard and we just want to have that view of things. 
the first change in GTK4 is that there's now an API available to let us know that we are pasting from ourselves. Uh, GTK Clipper is local. That's convenient and can replace a uh, horrible hack that we're using in the GTK3 version. That's a positive. In the GTK3 version, it used to be that formats were identified by GTK atoms, and we got uh, the MIME type that of that format by calling GTK atom name to get that, and then we would call GTK clipboard wait for contents to get the data synchronously and converted that and returned from that to the various formats that we use internally. Uh, fairly straightforward from our perspective. It's more complicated now with GTK4. We can use GTK clipboard get formats and we have the ability to call GTK content formats get mime types and that to get the mime types that we want. So that's more straightforward than the previous mechanism. But there's only a synchronous mechanism to get the data now. You have to call GTK clipboard read a sync and then a whole set of callbacks are, are triggered by that and you're given a GTK input stream to read the data from and you read a chunk of data and then you uh, return back uh, to request it to read the next chunk and eventually it will arrive back with the final chunk and at which point you have all the data that you need from the clipboard um, so it's a, a more roundabout mechanism from our perspective it basically was already doing something very similar to that but it was hidden behind the GTK clipboard wait for contents was hiding a lot of this complexity for us so basically we replaced that and we have to shoehorn these new asynchronous APIs into the LibreOffice view of how the clipboard works so we end up spinning the main loop during cut and place until eventually um, uh, the pace completes and we have the full amount of data that we were requesting from the clipboard Drag and drop is uh, strongly related to cut and paste. Uh, so when it comes to management of the data that we get from drag and drop or we reuse in drag and drop, we can effectively reuse the same code that we did for cut and paste. The GTK3 event-driven drag and drop has now been replaced by GTK4's controller-driven drag and drop. Uh, the changes to this versus the other controller conversion as shown in the event slide is is much more extensive but for the most part uh, there are equivalent calls in the GTK4 than there was in GTK3 and it's just a matter of puzzling out which one uh, maps to which. Uh, what changes is in launching a drag and drop the GTK drive begin now takes a GTK content provider argument and that describes what data the drag and drop will provide and then will write that data when requested. So to make all this work in LibreOffice, we have to implement our own GDK content provider, and that then translates the LibreOffice view, the data, the GDK's view. Drawing, the changes in drawing. Uh, the changes in drawing are uh, the most extensive changes uh, versus all the other ones. And GTK3 uh, was previously possible to connect to the draw signal in a custom GTK widget get back a, a Cairo context and we just split our backing surface to that and GTK will have clipped that destination surface to the areas that have been marked as invalid. Uh, when we know that part of our backing surface has changed we are tracking the damaged area and we just tell GTK3 uh, with that GTK widget queue draw area what areas are now invalid. This is all changed in GTK4 but there still exists uh, some routes to reuse our existing Cairo based drawing mechanisms to get something working straight away under GTK4 without having to investigate too deeply the new mechanisms of doing things. So to make all that work I decided to use a GTK drawing area for our custom drawing instead. This is how it looks in GTK3. Uh, just for reference at the top you have your menu bar which is a native GTK menu bar and you can see in the GTK inspector window which I've placed on top there that you have a top level GTK window and then you've grid and then that contains two members the first member is that menu bar and then uh, we have the GTK event box and that's the event box that we listen to for in GTK3 for all of our mouse events and other uh, keyboard events etc Inside that then we have this custom widget, this OOO fixed widget. Uh, that's the widget that we draw to. And we draw to that by listening to the draw signal in the previous slide. 
we can also host native elements uh, like the sidebar widgets we can host them directly in that uh, fixed widget in GTK4 as I said earlier we have now changed to drawing to the GTK3 drawing area uh, GTK fix still remains but now we've placed two of them inside an overlay so what we have is a drawing area, GTK drawing area that fills the entire window and then we use the overlay to float that GTK fixed up on top of it which means that we can still continue to put our sidebar widgets into the GTK fixed and have them up on top of the drawing area um, for positioning purposes side effects of uh, the changes in GTK4 is that there is no longer uh, the queue drawing area only the ability to call the full GTK widget queue so only that remains left to trigger the redraw and on the redraw we're blitting our entire backing surface on every redraw so on every cursor uh, blink the whole thing is, is blitted again this all this all works uh, and it feels fine in practice performance wise but and the long one, we, we may need a rethink on that one. The other part of the drawing changes, from our perspective, our drawing changes, is that GDK's foreign drawing API is removed, so there is no longer a simple route to render our VCL widgets to look like they are GDK widgets. Where we're using GDK widgets, this isn't an issue, but some of the remaining VCL user interface elements, like the application scroll bars uh, in GDK4, revert back to their built-in original VCL look which you may have seen in the demo earlier. User interface descriptions. In GTK4 the widget inheritance hierarchy has changed. So previously a GTK spin button inherited from GTK entry. So GTK entry properties could be used in GTK spin buttons as well. Now in 4 it inherits directly from GTK widget. Uh, other changes are that the generic container API has been removed in favor of specific APIs for every container. So GDK Box and GDK Grid have their own APIs for adding and removing children, and the generic API of GDK Container Add and Remove doesn't exist in GDK4 anymore. So the user interface file format for GDK4 has correspondingly changed, and it's an error to load properties in GDK4 that, that were removed. And this can happen as in the case of GK spin button where the property used to exist but no longer exists. There's a whole set of other changes as well. Seeing as we're not planning to change over to solely GTK4, uh, we need some sort of uh, interim mechanism to continue to support both versions. So we manage this in two parts. Uh, first is basically after the part of the GTK3 migration guide, the preparation in GTK3 is to make the changes there that are recommended for GTK3 applications in advance of becoming GTK4 applications and these are applied to the user interface files in, in Git so these are statically done. So this script, the bin UI rules enforcer, it rewrites our user interface files to remove properties and elements that have been deprecated or contraindicated already in GTK3. For the most part uh, the properties appear to be accidental properties, maybe somebody fat fingered something or accidentally used the scroll wheel while hovering over the panel in Glade so you get cases of where that double buffered property is set to something which is not something that we ever want to do uh, or perhaps that a tracked visited links property has been toggled on in a GDK label mostly meaningless accidental changes and uh, that's the static part of things dynamically then uh, when we take these GDK3 UI files at runtime we runtime convert them to the GTK4 equivalent properties and um, layout. Uh, this is conceptually similar to the GTK4 builder tool that comes with GTK4 uh, except that the builder tool uh, will only give you a kind of a template from which you have to make your final changes manually. The scope of possibilities of what you get in a generic UI file are, are too broad really to make a perfect conversion but in our case uh, we can take advantage of the fact that we have a a uniform nature of our UI so they're all basically following the same pattern and we can use the initial uh, static script to find and identify and fix up any of the cases where there's uh, some confusion as what the conversion should be like and force certain rules there so we continue to have a, a legal GTK3 version that we can convert automatically to create functional GTK4 UI versions 
um, at runtime. GTK image, GTK picture. In GTK3, you have a single class GTK image. In GTK4, this has been split effectively into two separate things. GTK image, which is a fixed ratio uh, widget uh, typically used for rendering icons. And then you have a GTK picture, which is less constrained. Uh, we have to basically decide uh, at load time, at runtime, what type of uh, destination GTK4 widget does the source GTK3 image have to be converted to so if we can see that it's loading an icon then it's a GTK image which is the typical case and then if we see that it's doing something different such as the help about uh, case then we have to convert to GTK picture so that adds a little bit of complexity to the conversion process uh, another changes related to that is that you can't create either of them from a chiral surface anymore but we continue in our GTK fort to keep our virtual devices to be backed by a chiral surface and we often want to create an image uh, from one of those. Uh, the argument they take now instead is a GTK paintable uh, so I've bridged that gap with a simple limitation of one of those GTK paintables called a surface paintable uh, that, can, that then uses this GTK snapshot append Cairo to append on the uh, snapshot of a Cairo surface to those widgets so we can continue to use our virtual devices with the replacements in GTK4. So that covers all the things that work or can be made to work with a little bit more effort. There's a whole set of other things that I haven't really investigated closely yet. So for example, GDK has split top levels into standalone application windows and pop-up windows. And I've made no effort to do anything with pop-up windows yet. So where GDK itself manages them directly, such as in the menu bar or pop-up menus, then they work perfectly fine. But for something like the VCL toolbar, that kind of drop-downs, they don't work at all yet. Accessibility has also changed pretty radically in GTK4. Uh, I've made no effort to uh, look into that from 3 to 4. And there's no code yet to bridge our existing accessibility implementation with the uh, GTK, GTK4 one. GTK threads set local uh, functions is also gone from GTK4, so Solar Mutex is no longer automatically acquired and released uh, by GTK. Um, I haven't really paid much attention to that yet, it doesn't make much of a difference when you're just using it directly as a user. Uh, some of the other toolkits have a similar problem, so we can adopt the same solution used there uh, for the GTK4 one if necessary. Uh, the other side of things then, GTK4 comes with built-in video support with GTK Media File, which looks quite exciting, but nothing is making use of that yet. But it does look like it should be possible to uh, replace our direct use of tree streamer with uh, GDK media uh, file instead, which would give us maybe more flexibility and hopefully a kind of a smoother, more integrated approach with the rest of the interface. So yeah, that's where we are. Um, GDK four yes. port exists and a lot of it works and a lot of it works. Work. A lot of it doesn't clear work. And most it's clear and for the most part, what needs to be done to parts work and get those parts there work. Are there are a few unknowns. There are a few unknowns. It looks it's very, very possible. Possible. It looks very very plausible. Um, GDK four uh, port, GDK4 port uh, will be successful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Are there any questions? I do not see any questions in the um, chat room. Colin, perhaps you have something to add. Uh, I need to add. Um, yeah, uh, I suppose uh, it's just worth mentioning as well that uh, as far as I can tell, all of the dialogues are working. So it's not the case that I was like skipping parts that don't work. Um, I know that there is a few cases uh, that aren't working 100%, but for the most part, we're talking about 95% of the user interface seems to be functioning fine. Uh, full screen isn't really a, a major issue as far as I can see. Uh, the one thing that is outstanding and most, most difficult is probably those pop-ups and the lack of foreign drawing. And it might be an easier in the long run to just continue the 
uh, existing welding stuff to end up just using a, a GTK4 scroll bars directly rather than spending any effort um, to emulate that now missing foreign drawing. So that's probably also the approach I'm considering for those pop-ups. So the reason I have investigated it is because I'm thinking about um, avoiding the need for it entirely if possible. Yeah. Uh Thank you. So Cisco is asking, uh, what was harder, the migration from GTK2 to GTK3 or from GTK3 to GTK4? Uh, for us, the migration from 2 to 3 was more difficult because when we did our GTK2 port, we knew that GTK, GTK2 was uh, backed by X. So we continued to use all of our old X-based stuff whenever we ran into the SAN with the GTK2 port. So when we went from two to three, we really had to do all the work we should have done uh, when we moved to two in the first place. So we had accumulated a, a large backlog of, of, of problems there, which meant that when GTK3, which could run under Wayland existed and, and half of that stuff just, just suddenly failed to work. So two to three is more difficult to get up and running to see anything on screen at all than it was from three to four to get something visible that you can motivate yourself to continue working from three to four was far easier though it does remain to be seen whether or not migration fully to the approved way of doing things for for rendering a gtk4 that might turn out to be more effort but clearly as you can see you can see something straight away so uh, that was much easier three to four than two to three okay thanks yeah as um they are coming in a lot of uh, praise for your work. Uh, Nicolas saying, Carolina, I rise a beer for you for the awesome GTK4 work. Thanks a lot. Um, Raphael is saying, GTK4 dialogues looks great, nice work. Even Candy is uh, impressive of the stuff you have mentioned. And Jemux. Um, I guess for the Zola Mutex stuff, you can go the same way than all other platforms, just moving all the GUI stuff to a main thread. It's probably faster too. What you know? This, um, yeah, no, I, <laughs> that's well, yeah, I feel pretty much the same way that it's probably easier not to try and fight the tide uh, and just accept that this is the way it is and seeing as other toolkits do the same thing. Um, follow the same approach and indeed dispatch onto the main thread if in the edge case something happens and not in the main thread in the first place which is fairly rare from perspective of somebody just using it normally you get cases like that in, in the extensions dialogue i think is one place where it comes up where stuff is done not in the main thread so yeah that's probably uh, the right way to go yeah hossein also is uh, praising your work and a question, do you know if the next uh, Red Hat uh, Enterprise uh, Linux version 9 will be shipped with GTK4 and it will be used for LibreOffice in it? No, no, LibreOffice will, will not be using GTK4 by default uh, this year at least anyway, because um, it just isn't going to be ready and it's not intended to be ready. Okay. Any other questions also from the audience here in the Digi rooms? Feel free. So if not, Kaolan, thank you very much. Not just for the talk, but also from my side for the uh, yeah. There's the beer from Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I and I know Nicholas is 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 good for his promises. So uh, uh, yeah, 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 I know, I know. He will uh, he will do it. So uh, thanks, thanks a lot for the work for the talk, and um, yeah, just we are five minutes ahead, but. Uh, May I invite all of you in the uh, LibreOffice uh, conference social room in the Jitsi room. This should be open for all. Um, the uh, exact link is uh, on the website of the conference. So perhaps we can have there a drink or a beer or a Coke or something like this, just to have a little conversation, social conversation beside uh, the conference. It's a LibreOffice social room in uh, Jitsi. I will lead over in a few minutes and uh, I would like to see some of you there.
So thanks so much for today. See you tomorrow again with a packed schedule. And um, if we not do join in the uh, social room, have a nice evening and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.